This is Keys to the Shop, Founder Friday Edition. Today we're talking with Nigel Price of Drip Coffee Makers in Brooklyn, New York. Well, hey everybody, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. My name is Chris DeFerio. I'm your host for the show, and I'm always excited to have you along for these episodes, and especially for these Founder Friday episodes. I know you all love hearing the stories of inspiring entrepreneurs, and uh, we definitely have a great one lined up for you today. Now, uh, if you would, just hit subscribe wherever you get this podcast, and that will really help the show and help you too because you get to be updated with new episodes as they come out. And also, please do share these episodes with a friend or with your team and spread the word about keys to the shop all around the world. That would be awesome too. Now, on top of doing this podcast, Keys to the Shop also offers consulting and coaching for you in your business, whether that's helping you open your first coffee shop or if you're an existing operator, helping guide and give you clarity on projects, problems, and opportunities. There's a lot of ways that we can work together, and I'd love to have a conversation all about how that might look. So give me an email, chris at keys to the shop.com. That's C H R I S at keys to the shop.com. We'll set up a free discovery call, have a conversation, and uh, we'll see what keys to the shop can do to help you build a thriving coffee shop. Again, that email for keys to the shop consulting, chris at keys to the shop.com. Now, today's episode of Keys to the Shop is brought to you by the Ground Control Cyclops Brewer from Voga Coffee. The Ground Control Brewer, guys, is absolutely uh, legendary. It has been churning the world upside down for batch brew coffee. The SCA award-winning technology gives you control over the extraction of an incredible range of flavors that previously uh, traditional batch brewing just couldn't get to. And it's like getting to know your coffee all over again, really. And not only is this a game-changing batch brewer, uh, it also makes batch diced lattes, tea, batch cold brew. So you're talking about increasing your versatility, efficiency, and all with a small footprint in a beautiful machine that's easy to train your staff on. So go check them out over at groundcontrol.coffee to learn more about this wonderful machine and look at all the cafes around the world that use it also. And I really do think that if you're looking for a level up in quality of your coffee and to build in efficiency to your bar all at the same time, definitely consider getting a Ground Control Cyclops Brewer for your cafe. Again, learn more over at groundcontrol.coffee. Today's episode is also brought to you by the Barista Series from Pacific, the line of plant-based performance beverages that are built for baristas, professional baristas, test and uh, taste all of these beverages before they even hit the market. So everything that you use from the Barista Series is going to stand up to the heat from steaming, produce amazing silky texture, great for latte art, and also it will get a balance to the cup. So the coffee is the star. It's not this overwhelming flavor. It's just perfect. And they work so hard at doing this um, because they know that it matters what you serve in the coffee. You work so hard on your coffee. Why not pair it with the best? I believe that is the barista series. So to get this in your store and try it for yourself, visit them over at pacificfoodservice.com. I think you're going to really be impressed. Again, if you really want to serve the best plant-based drinks to your customers, then I think you need to be using the barista series from Pacific. Okay, everyone. Well, today we have a great Founder Friday in store for you with the founder of Drip Coffee Makers in Brooklyn, New York, Nigel Price. Previously, Nigel had a career in finance in New York, but then switched over to coffee and started Drip Coffee as a mobile coffee unit that eventually got its own brick and mortar and now has multiple locations and has really grown in reputation over the years. They are a a multi-roaster shop and their offering is one of simple hospitality and coffee done well. And in this conversation with Nigel, we are going to be discussing the founding of this business and what went into the decisions to start and uh, change careers, what it was like to start in coffee as a mobile business and then go from that to a brick and mortar and then again to expand to multiple locations. You know, of course, there's many opportunities, many challenges that come with growing your business. And I think Nigel's perspective on coffee, community, 
and quality has been something that's absolutely resonating with New Yorkers. And I think it's going to resonate with you as well. So it's an absolute pleasure to get to talk to Nigel. So without anything else from me, let's get right to it. Here now is my Founder Friday interview with the founder of Drip Coffee Makers in Brooklyn, New York, Nigel Price. All right, Nigel, thank you so much for being a guest here uh, on the show, A Keys to the Shop. Welcome. I'm glad to have this conversation today. I appreciate you extending the invitation. It's um, it's an honor. I've, I've I've listened to a lot of your podcasts over the years, way before I thought I'd be actually uh, given an interview on a podcast. That was pretty cool. Wow, that's awesome. Uh, I'm I'm excited to just kind of dive into your story and your entry into the coffee industry, um, and and sort of it's a shift of career for you that you've got into the specialty coffee industry. And I wonder if you can kind of start from the beginning of how you became sort of, uh, first, I guess, infatuated with coffee. Um, but then, you know, how did that turn into something professional? Like what were you doing before coffee? And then how did coffee sort of infiltrate your, your career trajectory? It seems like a whole lifetime ago, but, um, I have to be honest, I really did not drink a ton of coffee maybe 15 years ago. So for me, opening a cafe was more of a, an escape from my corporate career. I naively thought that it wouldn't be as much work as it is. Um, I was like, oh, I can um, quit this nine to five and just hang out in the cafe all day. And even then, I really had no idea. I mean, I, I think for the most part, the industry didn't really have an idea in terms of what specialty coffee was. So I really approached it the way any um, anybody who's I, I studied um, finance and economics. So I really approached it from purely a widgets and digits perspective in terms of just what makes money, what's profitable. Um, if I open the cafe, I'll buy the coffee at X and sell it at Y. And I've never really even considered the human aspect of it or the people component that goes into running a cafe, which is probably 95% of it. Once I left corporate America, I kind of um, started working in coffee shops, and I naively thought it'd be maybe six or seven months before I can start um, looking or scouting places for me to actually open my shop. And one, I had no idea how much it would cost to open a shop, and two, um, I really underestimated the amount of coffee knowledge needed to successfully open a shop. I think a lot of owner operators are kind of clueless in regards to how how the shop actually runs. And I think that's why I ended up spending almost 10 years working in different coffee shops. But my actual love for coffee didn't happen well into, I, I'd want to say I already spent four or five years in coffee before I got to a point where it became something I appreciated and understood from a specialty coffee standpoint. This is pretty early on in the industry when um, the reigning kings, the stump towns and counterculture, they pretty much um, controlled most of the domain in, in the spaces I worked in. So let me kind of get, get a little bit more insight into something you mentioned here, which was that you, uh, naive, you said, I naively thought that it would be six to seven months you know, before I could start scouting locations. Right. Um, and... I wonder what was happening in your career that gave you the idea that, oh, there's a lot more to this than I thought and prevented you from like just bullheadedly following that idea. I'd probably say the, the overall, well, the most prevalent issue was I worked for a lot of, um, for the lack of a better term, I'll say mom and pop shops, whereas these um, one-off independent shops. And I've seen... I learned a lot about what not to do watching some of these um, individuals um, run their business. And that really made me um, step back and realize that I'm going to have to really do the homework and approach it from a, from a different perspective. Um, I don't even know if it was naive, me being naive or just being ignorant. I just didn't realize how difficult it was going to be to um, successfully run a shop. I mean, a lot, you know, even in the time that I've spent in coffee, I've seen so many shops open and close and some with some really, really big uh, fanfare. Um, a couple had a ton of like um, funding and invested capital. They they failed um, for 
for lack of a better term, in my opinion, because they didn't do that planning. Um, they didn't approach it from trying to figure out what they are offering in regards, in relation to what all the other coffee shops are offering or what differentiates you from the coffee shop that's two blocks away. Um, so I've seen a lot of um, these shops open and close. And to, to, to jump back a little bit, I started writing a business plan two years before I left corporate America thinking that, um, you know, by the time I got out the door, I'd be ready to hit the ground running without ever working in, in a coffee shop. That <laughs> goes to my <laughs> arrogance in terms of um, what I thought it was actually going to be. I mean, like most people, most of the time they spend in coffee shops are especially um, in the late 90s, it was sitting in these comfy couches and these big chairs. And, you know, this is even before they had internet in most coffee, coffee shops. So I'm really dating myself. But um, you don't realize how much work goes um, goes on behind the counter. I remember those days in the 90s for sure. I, I always think about the uh, <laughs> opening scene in uh, Mike Myers, So I Married an Axe Murderer, when they have the, the large cappuccino. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's kind of this the friends central perk type type of thing. Um yeah. but your business that that's fascinating that you had a business plan and for a lot of people who want to open a coffee shop, it feels like the business plan is sort of like the ultimate achievement that will unlock success for you <laughs> in biz I mean, did it feel like that yeah. for you once you kind of honed that thing? It totally did. And, um, you know, obviously hindsight's always twenty twenty. but I, I recall a lot of people saying how important it was. And at the time I was planning on just borrowing a, a bunch of money from, from a bank too. So you kind of have to go through that business plan um, process. And initially I thought it was the most ridiculous thing. I mean, one, you're basically making up numbers. A lot of the pro forma numbers are just kind of, are just, not even educated guesses. They're just kind of guesstimates of what you think you'll be doing based on the neighborhood you'll open your shop in. And I still feel like that's nonsensical in terms of the amount of time and energy that you have to spend doing it. But the part of the business plan that really was the most important was deciding what your voice is going to be in terms of what your coffee shop is saying that other shops aren't saying. And I, I guess you can use this across all industries. You know, whatever your business is, you, what you're doing has to has to be saying, communicating something that others are not. Otherwise, you just kind of get lost in the shuffle. Did you find your voice by working in coffee? Yes, definitely. Which is probably why, um, you know, and it's probably a good thing that I didn't have the capital to open right away because um, I feel I would have met the same fate as a lot of the um the shops I've um, worked at because you oh, it's almost like um, I don't know, pan dues is an over, overly used um, <laughs> right. term, but you really have to go through those hard knocks. Um, even um, perfect example, the, <laughs> the reason why it was so difficult <laughs> a couple of weeks ago for us to get on this call was because I spent a week, almost a week and a half covering shifts um, filling in and doing a lot of the quote unquote grunt work that a lot of, um, prospective, uh, coffee shop owners don't, uh, <laughs> don't see, which is why it's overly glamorized in terms of the perception of what they think owning a coffee shop is. And I feel like if you don't do that time in those, uh, in those shops and really learn the ropes, you're unable to fill in those gaps. Yeah. At least not without, you know, you know, losing your mind a little bit. And yeah. <laughs> I'm sure that over the the 10 years that you spent working in coffee, there's a certain kind of, um, I don't want to say callousness, but you're seasoned to the degree that, you know, when you have to cover a shift, it doesn't feel like this affront to you. This, this like, yeah. oh, I can't believe yeah. what's happening to me right now. It just is part yeah. of the job. <laughs> exactly. So when you were working in your first coffee jobs from, you know, you have this business plan, you left corporate America, you started working in coffee. Um, what happened in the first couple of years that uh, and it, you, you really started to see um, there's more to this? Like you mentioned what goes on behind the scenes. 
What was it about those early jobs in coffee that started to really form up your voice? And what was it that you started deciding would be what you do in coffee? Like you, did you still want to open a coffee shop after those first couple of years? And, and how did you decide to proceed in, in what your message would be? I think for me, and this is something that's still ongoing, like I started moving so far away from dialing in to the specifics of coffee and regions. And really, it really became about the people connection for me. Um, A lot of even um, some of the coffees that we carry are from roasters all over the world. I mean, some of the processes are still, um, still in development. You know, you can drill down so deep and really nerd out with somebody in regards to what they're drinking or what what you just made for them. But we don't typically don't do any of that unless the guests themselves prompt those questions. I think initially it was very coffee centric or coffee focused. And we slowly started turning it into approachability and accessibility and kind of taking down some of the walls. I mean, even honestly, if I think if I wasn't so passionate and gung ho about opening my own shop, I don't know if I would have lasted that long in coffee because um, there was so much gatekeeping at the time. It was a lot of folks who were like, this is how it's done. This is how you should do it. If you're not doing it this way, then you're not a real coffee professional. Yeah. You know, um, I was lucky enough to work with some real coffee professionals who really I attribute a lot of how I carry myself now to them. What's the difference between a real coffee professional and one who is kind of a, let's say what you mentioned earlier, sort of a showy coffee professional, I'd say a little insecure, that gatekeepy professional. You know, um, as corny as it sounds, it's the person who um, actually acknowledges the guest in front of them. Um, The person who is more concerned with what this person wants to drink or the mood that this guest is in as opposed to imposing what they want on the guest. It's amazing to me that in 2022, um, we're still having these conversations about people who may want a drop of milk in their pour over. You know, I've worked um, with people who would constantly say things like, oh, when I open my shop, I'm not even going to carry milk. I, so no one puts milk in a coffee or I'm not going <laughs> to, uh, or like, we're not going to have sugar or, you know, we're not going to, I mean, and I totally get it. I totally get it. And I think um, what most people don't realize is that you kind of have to bring people along. Um, most people who drink coffee are completely casual coffee drinkers. So it's a waste of time. It's a fool's errand almost to try to, turn every guest into this um, specialty coffee, you know, maven at this. I think um, (laughs) we, we, I think uh, we lost touch in terms of ultimately our job is to provide a service. We're making a cup of coffee for the guests and they're paying for it. Now that said, I love the opportunity to talk somebody through a pour over and actually explain to them how, you know, what these farmers did to get these coffees from the farm to their washing station. Um, There's tons of stories you can tell, but um, I think what separates a coffee professional from the, the arrogance of, um, well, it actually still exists, but the arrogance of someone who kind of wants to, I don't know, maybe maybe it could just be some people need to self-validate as well. So I, right. I, I don't know. I mean, we can speculate for forever on that, but, um, it reminds me, uh, it reminds me of, uh, the, the, the dad on vacation who is like really wants everyone to have a good time and just ruins it. <laughs> it's like, this is what we're going to do. We got to be there on time and you're going to have a good time because we're paying a lot of money for this. Exactly. That that's, you know, that's an excellent analogy. Excellent. Um, I see Chevy Chase it comes to mind, but, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so when the, um, realization came in to you that, you know, 
there are these two types of paths that I could go down. I'm going to go down the one that's reaching out to people and, and is people focused. Um, you can, I mean, 10 years is a long time to spend in the industry, you know, a, a decade yeah. of prof professional coffee work. Some people who start out in the business of coffee, uh, as baristas go through that time, uh, networking and developing their skills, developing as a yeah. person, but they stay sure. there and they don't open their shop. And you still did. I mean, you must have always wanted to continue to pursue that dream of opening a shop through this time. And, and where, where in this journey did you actually decide, okay, now I'm going to sort of recalibrate and enter into becoming a coffee shop owner versus just working in coffee? I think it happened once um, a lot of the... Um the Coffee Expo, Barista Championships, and watching a lot of these guys um, win. And then a couple actually will go off and like kind of open their roasteries or open their coffee shops. And um, I have to say, I, you know, and these, this is in between, in between air quotes, I borrowed a lot from um, some of these guys who, um, uh, especially uh, like Barista in Portland, and um, mm -hmm. in terms of um, elevating the guest experience and um, just the whole concept of um, multi roasters, it's not something that's in abundance on, on the East Coast. But I feel like on the West Coast, it was a common thing. Um, I'm always amused when people are kind of like, oh, how did you come up with this? As if I invented it. But um, <laughs> Right. <laughs> and I kind of have to remind them that, um, that I didn't. But... Uh, uh, yeah, I would have to say um, once I started seeing a lot of these guys transform from just, you know, baristas to coffee shop owners, I spent a lot of time reading, um, reading a lot of um, industry industry pieces that were written on some of these guys. And um, I just I just studied it. I really just studied it from the perspective of pros and cons, because like I said, initially, obviously, it was hard to get a job in coffee. Cause I didn't have the experience, but once I had experience, I was able to work for some of the more specialty leaning coffee shops in the city. I think it was more of just building up my own confidence in terms of, can I actually do this? You know, ironically, I still don't feel like I know everything, but I at least have the confidence to feel like, okay, I can manage, <laughs> <laughs> you know, or at least stay afloat. Yeah, it's interesting because you went from a, building a business plan that gave you this sense of security. It, then you go and you become even more likely to succeed because of your experience, but now you're less likely to be as confident, which actually seems like an asset yeah. <laughs> going forward because I, I guess it would really just keep you humble in your pursuit of it, right? I kind of feel like anyone who's not terrified, especially <laughs> regardless of what your, your business or your area of ex expertise I feel like if you're not afraid, I I I worry about your mental of uh, your mental capacity because it's, it's um <laughs> you can't be sane and not realize all the variables and keeping all the plates spinning. It's um it's a daunting task. Well, how did you start? What was the beginning of Drip, and what made you decide on that uh, particular model? I've always, uh, for me personally. The only way I will have a cup of coffee is if I have the time to make myself a pour over. It's the only time where the notes and a lot of what's in the bag gets ex expressed in a cup. I've worked in a lot of coffee shops who they offered pour overs, but it was never a focal point. And then the complaints that people would have about the pour over was, oh, it takes so long. It takes six minutes or it takes eight minutes. And um I've realized that if you made it a focal point, you could probably, you know, hone those numbers down to the time that it takes to make a latte. I mean, do a lot of trial and error. Once I kind of honed that in, then it was kind of setting up a proof of concept to see if people would wait, to see if people would put the amount of value on a cup of coffee that I felt needed to be put on the coffee in terms, in order to make it um, profitable. I mean, Ultimately, you know, it doesn't matter what you're selling and how passionate you are about the business. You kind of have to, you have to make it work financially. Right. 
So I got a cart and I started, I literally would just kind of pop up around 2018, 2019. And I would pop up at places around the city and, um, and just make coffee for people. Um, I did, um, I did a few, um, like, uh, some like fashion shows and I'd be down by the farmer's market and a couple of farmer's markets in Brooklyn every Saturday, every Sunday, sometimes during the week, depending on how the week worked out. I consistently had a line of people who didn't mind waiting because in their mind, this was something worth waiting for. It wasn't, um, you know, it was going to be an experience. I think that's important in terms of what you're selling someone as well. Um, if they thought they were getting a, just a regular cup of coffee, they wouldn't have the desire to wait the three or four minutes that it took. How did you make the distinction between just a regular cup of coffee um, and what you were doing? Was it was it branding? Was it you know uh, knowledge of what was going to be served ahead of time at the events? How did you market this to really let people know what you're going to experience is, is different? A lot of branding, um, and a lot of it is on a subconscious level. Like on the menu, we um, the menus in the shop now, our quote unquote regular coffee we call it batch brew, and the pour over coffee is is the drip. Um, so we have a drip menu, and um, but even when I was on the cart, the display itself, the the, the stage that was set for the for making coffee. It was just something that most people just don't see. Um, and I think that was also a big draw as well. It's like, you're going to make me a coffee with this, you know, this giant grinder and these like um, funnels and, you know, and the scales. And I think it was also a part of the show as well <laughs> as to the experience. It's interesting that for yeah. a lot of people, and this is true about latte art as well, I think. Because we, you and I, who have been in the industry for a, a while, we know about pour overs and we know about latte art. Yeah. And yet there are thousands, yeah. maybe yeah. millions yeah. of people that have no idea about this stuff. And we like to think that maybe everything is, is saturated. And here you are in New York City of all places. And it's not like there's no specialty coffee places in New York City at this time. Uh, but you're offering pour overs and people are like, wow, this is really special. I mean, it just, I guess it just, just goes to show you that people yeah. still need to be introduced to uh, a special way of, of making coffee because that, if any market is saturated, it would be the one you're in. You would think, you would think so. I mean, I think, um, and this may be um, evident for most industries, but I think a lot of time industry folks are in a bubble. And we kind of, we don't realize what's going on outside of a bubble. And it was also, it was really a wake up call for me as well. And a lot of, um, <laughs> a lot of those Saturday and Sunday um, afternoons, I'd be out there, my wife as well. I don't think she really took, took it serious as a business until we were out there. And I recall her saying a few times, she's like, this could really be a business. <laughs> now, mind you, this has been something I've been doing for over a decade, you know, <laughs> And she's like, yeah, you know, I think you might actually have something here. But uh, again, but it, I still needed to do that proof of concept just to kind of satisfy my own curiosity in terms of will this actually work? Well, once you satisfied that curiosity and then, you know, your wife was <laughs> convinced, um, <laughs> what uh, was the next step? Because you eventually went from a, uh, a cart and a popping up right. uh, to a brick and mortar. Talk about that transition. Uh, geez, um, I feel like I'm still transitioning, but <laughs> um, <laughs> luckily, um, luckily I, I made up my mind um, pretty early on that I was done trying to borrow the capital that I wanted. Um, and this is another reason why it took as long as it did because um, I did a lot of saving. So I think the transition wasn't, um, the burden wasn't financial, which is what it is for a lot of shops. For me, it was, right. um, it was actually getting out of the frame of mind that I am um, just going to be making coffee for people. It's the other 90, 85, 90% of the tasks that need to be done in order for the ship to stay afloat. 
Um, so for me, that was the transition. Even now, I have I have at least you know three or four baristas that I I'm scared to lose now because um they're totally qualified to do a lot of the running around. I call it doing rounds at night in terms of restocking and making sure the shops are ready for the next day of service. Um, but I, it's so difficult for me to get out of the mindset that I need to kind of let these things go so that I could focus on the other parts of the business that need attention. So for me, I think the transition, the hardest part of the transition was getting out of the mindset that um, I need to make the best cup of coffee and kind of get into the mindset of I need to run the most efficient shop. Does that steal any of the joy of it from you? Tons. <laughs> Tons, because what what it actually turns into is almost um, it takes me away from what I really, really love doing, which is, you know, as silly as it sounds, I just really enjoy making coffee. And I really enjoy the conversation that comes up around coffee. A lot of the guys on the team now, I think they they take advantage of the fact that you know, I don't mind picking up a shift if they can't make it in. I don't think I've ever said, no, I'm not going to come. You have to show up for your shift. But also, you know, getting back to the original statement, that time spent, like those one or two shifts spent in the shop every day is time that I'm not spending strategizing or preparing for the next move. But yeah, I'm, I'm trying to strike a balance because I'm, um, that is what I enjoy the most. Well, in the effort to strike a balance, it feels like there's this tension of almost like this um, two choices you've got. One, you can be uh, the the operator, the one who works behind the scenes to make it all go, or you can be the barista, but you can't do both. What do you? Th- where are you on that? Because it feels like you have this passion for doing the, you know, face-to-face work with, with customers. But at the same time, it feels like you're, uh, looking at it. Like if I don't put more focus on the operations, then, then maybe think bad things will happen. Yeah. yeah I'm, um, even saying it out loud, I'm kind of, uh, <laughs> I, I'm, it's like, I know what has to happen. Like, um, and I am getting myself prepared to kind of hand the reins over, um, to the to, to the folks I have now, so that um I can because it it you know full disclosure there's a lot of things that, <laughs> a lot of fires that are like left burning. It's almost I don't know I don't even know if, if it's in, like if I'm intentionally even but it's just it's just really difficult for me to get to the place where I'm like okay I can no longer allocate this amount of time to being in the shops. Um, I finally got to a point where I stopped going to every shop and dialing in every coffee every day or every other day. You know, even that was difficult. Um, but um, it's one of those things mm-hmm. that you, you you have to do. How many shops do you have now? Uh, four. One, the, okay. um, the, last, um, the last shop is, is we're basically running a coffee program inside of a cafe, inside of an art gallery in Williamsburg. So, so oh, that wow. shop is not really labor, coffee labor intensive, whereas like it's not this large pour over program there like the other three shops. But then there's also other things that need to be dealt with in terms of, um, you know, I've never had quote unquote partners. So even coordinating things that are going to be going on at that particular cafe, I feel obligated to kind of loop people in. Like if I want to do a cupping there, like I I want to make sure they're all that we're all on the same page. Even that, that's something that doesn't necessarily require. It shouldn't anyway. It shouldn't require my full attention. But um, no, I get it. And you know, even in the uh, stage you're in right now, it feels like something similar to what Danny Meyer did. Um, you know, in the setting the table book, he talks about only opening right. restaurants yeah. that he could walk to. He wants to walk to his restaurant every day. I'm not sure if he still does that or not. He certainly <laughs> doesn't do it with Shake Shack. But <laughs> uh, but the owner's passion and, and you know, 
the, the culture that you bring to it is, is super important. And, you know, as you multiply shops, I imagine that it becomes more difficult to sort of manage what you want to see happen culturally and you know, quality wise in each store. Uh, talk to me a little bit about what you what you discovered in opening the brick and mortar in terms of operations and how it informed the way you approached scaling from one to four stores. Without without boring you to death, it was um, I would have to say, with the exception of the first location, um, um, Bushwick, all of the other locations um, kind of fell in our lap in term in regards to guests who came by the shop or folks who heard about the shop and wanted to offer this amenity to the people in their building or the people in their um, their neighborhood. And I was really blessed. Um, the first time I had to actually put up a help wanted sign was maybe a month ago. Um, but prior to that, almost every employee, and literally every employee we had was either a guest or a friend of one of the baristas that were on board. Um, so staffing and culture, we were able to hold on to because um, during, you know, right, right before COVID and during COVID, there was a glut of these extremely sophisticated, over, <laughs> overqualified baristas without jobs um, because so many shops were closing. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm fighting, <laughs> I'm fighting as hard as I can to hold on to a lot of them. How do you select people in, in, in that, you know, there are people who say, I love your coffee. I'm a, I'm a customer or I'm a friend of a barista. Um, and for a lot of people, they would say, well, um, any friend of so-and-so is a friend of mine. So go, yeah. you, know, you got the job kind of thing. <laughs> I, I imagine there's more to it than that, but like, what's the right fit and what are the, what's the framework you use to sort of decide who's, who's going to be, you know, waving the flag of drip. You know what? I'm almost, um, I'm almost ashamed to say, but <laughs> it's pretty much been, has been happening exactly the way you just mentioned it. It's ah. really like, um, you know, um. And again, when like I, I may be throwing this term around lightly, but to be, in my opinion anyway, to be a coffee professional is not someone, I mean, we all need a job, we all need to make money, but um, to be a coffee professional is a, is a different level than just making coffee for, for folks. I don't think I would even still have the doors open if it wasn't for the baristas that I hired. Um, because, even if you read the Google reviews and most of the <laughs> the comments, very rarely does anyone say that single origin anaerobic coffee I had from you know, from Ethiopia was the best ever. Mm-hmm. The, they, they almost always lead with everybody there is so friendly. The baristas are so helpful. And um, if I don't get that vibe while... I'm talking to you, then I'm just going to assume that my guests probably won't. And then it won't, it just won't be a good fit. And if I get that vibe and, you know, so far, knock on wood, it's, I've been <laughs> extremely lucky in that regard. And, and there's a lot that comes from intuition too. So where somebody who doesn't have experience in the industry, experiencing both good and bad coworkers yeah. and bosses and yeah. <laughs> all that stuff, um, there's not a lot of institutional wisdom and, and gut level knowledge that you bring to the table. So you're left with having to invent very, um, you know, calculated interview questions to sort of make up for that lack of knowledge. Yeah. But it seems like you, you've got some internalized, uh, radar on this to, to say, yeah, if, if it sounds almost flippant to say the word vibe when you're talking yeah. about hiring, but I think there's more to it than just that word it makes it sound like it's something deeper. It's a little more to it, but you, but you, you're spot on because it, it, that's really all it's about. I mean, there's a handful of shops in New York that I absolutely love, and I go when I need a good cup of coffee, but I don't particularly enjoy the vibe. And there's been times where I'll opt to go someplace other than those shops because I'm just not in the mood to, <laughs> to have to, you know, to deal with that. And, you know, it's unfortunate, but um, that was, uh, it was one of the, one of the 
things I definitely wanted to stay away from, stay, stay clear away from in terms of having people who are not hospitable because ultimately it is hospitality. So, so then a lot of businesses, because we, we, you know, talked briefly just a second ago about the fact that, you know, COVID started and the epicenter was like New York city. I mean, I remember when yeah. it, coffee fest, New York city was happening in 2020, right before everyone knew exactly how dangerous and crazy this was going to get. Um, and you're right in the middle of all of this. And how, how did you experience that as a business owner and, and what did it do to sort of, if anything, redirect or, or in, uh, distill values or how did it impact your business even to today? You know, I, um, I almost feel guilty because I don't really have a bad COVID story. You know, um, my family and friends relatively unscathed. The business not only did well, but thrived in, in the fact that the Bushwick location is in such a residential location that um, typically I'd catch, you know, for that first month or two, someone would come by, have a cup of coffee, and then get on the train and go to work. Once COVID set in and people realized that they were going to be working from home, you know, I would see people twice, maybe three times a day. Um, I was selling a lot of merch. Um, mm -hmm. People are coming in for their, like, informal tutorials in the, <laughs> on how to make a better pour over at home. It gave me time, and especially because since I couldn't hire anybody during that time, it was just me in the shop seven days a week from six to six. So um, I really um, oh, man. honed in on every single guest that came, that came in. Whether I wanted to or not, I was going to hear about the kind of day they were having or you know, who was sick, uh, who were breaking up and who were <laughs> getting COVID married and, you know, but all of that galvanized us in that neighborhood. Um, we really became a, a fixture. So it really, uh, to answer your question, COVID actually made me double down on that people first mentality. It, it has to be about what the guests want even the different locations where, you know, it's four drip locations, but each one has, has its own unique character based on the neighborhood that is servicing. So at this time, it's just the one shop and it's um, now, you know, the four shops and I am just really feels like, you know, this expansion, you know, that happened, you know, probably pretty soon after, you know, I say quote unquote after COVID or the yeah. initial, <laughs> you know, thing, the, um, galvanizing of your people focus certainly seems like it must have had something to do with how people you know viewed your brand and when those opportunities came up and, you know by by sowing those seeds of hospitality i'm sure that some of the fruit of that is you know seen in your locations yeah and this is honestly um and again it's not like i had a crystal ball or i knew this was the path but it just um, the people, you know, people first mentality to me made the best sense. And the, you know, the version of me that studied uh, finance at school would probably <laughs> very much dislike this older version because I was definitely not, like, I was completely the opposite. Um, the opposite in school and like in my, my previous career. Um, you know, I've had relations. Well, I mean, I can't even call them relationships. I've had working situations, you know, with um, folks that I've sat next to for years, and we've never had nowhere near the the kind of conversations that I've had with complete strangers that I I don't even know their names that come in the shop for coffee. Um, it's just um, yeah, it's one of those things that you can't explain. It. You have to experience it. Um, and it's one of the things I didn't realize I was going to get out of coffee. Yeah. I, I love hearing that kind of that juxtaposition between like the, the quote unquote, like young you and yeah. like the you of today. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The edges get softened. I, I, I've yeah. been told by my wife that my edges have been softened also over the years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that does happen physically and physically and mentally. 
Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, I mean, I'm softened. <laughs> <laughs> um, when you're talking about hospitality and being people first, I wanted to touch on this briefly here was, you know, since you're a multi roaster shop and there is an incredible number of uh, roasters to choose from, it seems like a very daunting task. It's almost like I want to choose one roaster to use because I just don't want to have to think about bringing in other roasters, let alone calibrating all of it. And, um, yeah. how do you go about selecting the coffees that you offer in the stores? You know, it, <laughs> I, and I, was, I hate to sound like a broken record or like a reoccurring nightmare, but um, it's the same, it's really the same approach. Um, we get tons of samples, like people send us coffee all the time. But um, if I've never had a conversation with you or you haven't reached out to me personally to, it's not like we have to be, um, you know, go steady or anything. But if the only um, relationship you want with Drip is purely financial or purely a business exchange of goods for services for a dollar, then it's going to be really hard for me to say, yeah, I'm going to start this business relationship with you and I'm going to sell your coffee. That said, a lot of... Um, Pretty much most, with the exception of like uh, Fritz, which is in South Korea, or you know some of the more um, global brands. But I've met pretty much all of the roasters that we carry, and um, and just and more than just beyond, I know their names. Like I've met and had conversations with these people. So to me, it's um, you know, it goes back to people and relationships again. Oh, that's great. And so you're you're consistent through and through with yeah. the people first thing. And of course the coffee has to be of a certain caliber. Yeah. And that's the, that's the flip side of it because there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of relationships I've had with folks who um, I didn't particularly feel like they're, you know, they're what they were offering met, met our needs or met our standards. Um, so that's the opposite end of the spectrum. But um, I think there's a lane for everybody. So now looking at what is uh, in the future for Drip and looking back to what has been, I, what are you the most proud of accomplishing over the years uh, as, a, as an owner, as a professional with uh, Drip? I don't know. I'm 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 scared to to to, to celebrate too soon. But um, <laughs> I think for right now, present day, I think the what I'm most proud of is the fact this thing that I that I thought could be a thing is actually a thing. Um, I haven't really thought. People are constantly asking, you know, what's the next move, and I really haven't done a lot of planning. Even um, our expansion, I. I didn't really see growth past Bushwick. And here we are two and a half years later and there's um, four different locations. So I've kind of uh, given up on trying to kind of put an itinerary together in terms of what's, what's next and just kind of allowing things to happen based on how I feel about it. What needs to be true about an opportunity for you to be um, feeling good about it like you could expand with a lot of opportunities that fall into your lap, but uh, they, they might not really vibe with what you have. Right. Um, so, so what is that? This is true. This, this is true. I mean, cause mm -hmm. obviously I've, I've said no a lot more than I said yes, <laughs> but um, yeah, it has to be mutually beneficial and it also has to add value. There's a lot of things that I could do to make, money or to extract more revenue out the business um you know there's a uh, coffees that we should be charging a lot more for that i don't because i want to keep it in a space where it's approachable where um people are picking coffees they want as opposed to what they could afford i think those those decisions not to kind of um hopefully it doesn't come back to haunt me but i'm i'm hoping those decisions benefit drip in the long run short run in the short term maybe not so much but in the long term i think um allowing drip to be approachable and allowing people of all means to be able to have a really really good cup of coffee 
I think in the long run would build a really, really good business model. Yeah. Sounds like that's exactly what you're doing right now. That's, that's the plan. <laughs> Exhausting <laughs> yeah. as it is, but that's the plan. Yeah. You've built it. You've built yourself and you've built this business. And I'm really grateful for people like you in the industry who have such a, a sort of grounded, if you'll pardon the pun, <laughs> uh, perspective on coffee and people and this this growth idea of, of it really boils down. And when I hear you talk, I hear a lot of integrity. And I, I think that's really important to do, it's especially today when you can kind of get away with yeah. uh, for a long time without it. Yeah. So um, I'm grateful for this conversation. And where can people learn more about Drip and you know visit you and buy your coffee and all that fun stuff? Um, right now, primarily on Instagram. <laughs> so um, we're still, you know, almost three years in, still working on a website. Um, but um, so we have a web page with the addresses, which is dripcoffeenyc.com. And but um, information, day to day stuff in terms of like events, it's likely um, you'll get that information on Instagram. Uh, Drip Coffee NYC again. But um, I really, um, you know, not to keep droning on about this, but I think people are constantly talking about the next wave of coffee. But I think this this next wave is inclusivity. Um, no more gatekeeping. A lot of the coffee shop owners that I talk to now, like I've, I've been, I don't want to say instrumental, but I've been very... Um, uh, giving with my time and energy in terms of helping other coffee shops in Brooklyn and Manhattan um, get get on the ground and get up and running because um, I think the more shops you have like this, the more options you have for people to realize that coffee should not be $3 a cup or, <laughs> or a bag of coffee shouldn't be, you know, Twelve dollars in the supermarket, um, and this way, producers and farmers can eventually start making more for their labor. Right, exactly. Yeah, whatever we want to say about, uh, about waves and, and metaphors for what's happening, yeah. the inclusivity part and the yeah, I, when you bring up gatekeeping, it really makes me think that there yeah. much of what we have as gatekeeping oftentimes is not purposeful. It's it's just maybe back to that idea of we don't know as much as we should, or we're going too fast and we end up pushing people away and we take our time and, and think about it long enough. Maybe we can have more people join us along the path. Yes. Yes. Nigel, great to talk to you and uh, hear your story. It was really a pleasure. Thank you so much for being on the show. No, thank you for having me. Well, I hope that you enjoyed that conversation with Nigel. And what I appreciate the most about this conversation was how focused on relationships Nigel is in his business and you know making sure that from the coffee that he brings in to the way that he treats his customers and the opportunities that he uh, pursues with his business that it's all focused on really and truly caring for people and serving them in a loving and accessible way and uh, we definitely need more people like Nigel in the coffee industry so a big thank you to Nigel Price for being my guest on the show so great to hear your story we really appreciate you um, if you want to learn more about Drip Coffee, you can go to dripcoffeenyc.com and definitely follow them on Instagram at dripcoffeenyc. And if you have any questions, comments, or feedback for me about today's episode or any other episode of Keys to the Shop, just give me a shout, chris at keys to the shop.com. That's also where you can reach out for Keys to the Shop Consulting chris at keys to the shop.com. And with that, that is the end of our episode today, everybody. Thank you so much for taking the time to uh, listen. Don't forget to subscribe to keys to the shop. Follow us on Instagram at keys to the shop, share these episodes, and also don't forget to have an amazing day. Thank you so much. And I hope that today's episode has truly given you keys to the shop. <laughs>